I'm sure for the Spartans, they had a clear idea of what their, what their direction was. And we as coaches need to set that direction. Right. The second thing is we need to be able to communicate that direction. It's one to be able to say this is where we want to go. But then we have to be able to communicate that effectively so that everybody in unison understands that. So again, having that vision, that direction of understanding where we want to go, and then communicating effectively. <laughs> the other is, is not only having that idea of where we want to go, but then the plan for getting there. The idea of how it's possible. <coughs> and how we communicate that, all right, both, both the destination and the plan has everything to do with the belief we have in our ability to get there. Again, Christopher Columbus said, he, he said over and over again, he said, I will share my vision for the future with anybody. And when they see the belief in my eyes, they will follow me. All right? What conviction, what passion do we share that? That destination as well as what we'll stand for. It is so important that we set that, that standard. One of the first things we did here when we were at the University of Louisville, I remember it though so distinctly, we were at Card Park, and I walk in and I'm introduced to a team that, that I had just met, first time I had met these guys. And the first thing I did, we all walked in there, and I said in very clear terms, I said, we will do everything with a high standard of excellence. Everything. Whether it's in a classroom, in a community or on a soccer field. Furthermore, we will be the program by which everybody will measure themselves. We will set the standard for excellence in all of it. And that was a starting point for creating a culture of, of giving that direction. And very early on, we talked about winning national championships. And I to be real honest with you, that first team that we inherited had no chance of winning a national championship. But you know what? We set the culture of that expectation, of that anticipation, of that was how we were going to, that was where we were headed. That was the direction. That was the goal. And again, from a standpoint of if you're responsible for any group or any team, and it's part of being a leader, is casting a vision. One, of the destination, but two, of what you will stand for, what you want it to look like. For us, it's how we dress, what we say, how we act, what we do. One of the things we'll, we'll get an opportunity to do is tomorrow, and we felt very strongly about this, is we'll sit in this room, and this will be the start of our training tomorrow morning. We'll put the coaches in the back and in the front rows, our guys will. And with just as if you were not there, we will run through a normal training with our team. And, and what you'll see in that time that we have, the hour and a half from when we are, about two hours from when we sit down to complete training, is the culture. Everything from how we greet the players, all right, to how we say goodbye. At the end, it's all part of the culture. It's all scripted. It's all determined. But we have to have that vision beforehand. We have to decide what are the things and the values that matter to us. If we have no idea of where we want to go, how do we know if we ever get there? How do we know if we ever achieve it if we never have a starting goal and not an idea of what we want it to look like? So first and foremost, I would challenge you as leaders you decide what is it that you want your culture to look like. How do you want them to act? Those things are really important. And then, the ability to communicate it effectively. All right? Part of creating that culture, though, is helping them, all right, by giving them the tools that they need to achieve the plan. Because we can set the destination and we can set the plan, but if we don't help them by providing them the tools necessary to get there, all right, there's no chance of it ever happening. So now we then, once we set the direction and the standard by which we want to live and how we want to act, we then have to help them become that. 
we have to help them move in that direction. Because left to their own, it's not likely going to happen. Left to their own, that culture doesn't ever get created. <clears throat> we have to give them the, the tools and the skills to be able to grow into that culture. To live that mission. And there's a few things that we do after we, we develop the vision. The second thing is, is encouragement. Now, encouragement means a couple different things. Most people think encouragement is, is just being praised. That's not necessarily it. Encouragement is not giving people what they want. <coughs> it's giving them what they need. That's what encouragement is. We had uh, an exercise we did the other day. Right now, we're doing a lot of uh, eight-hour week. We have only eight hours with them. And we can only have two of those hours in training. So the other hours are doing conditioning and strength training and things like that. So we have a number of about six weeks that we do this that we build up their fitness level. So each day that we come and we do a conditioning exercise, we, we take it to another level. We start with, we go two times five at a steady rate, then we go two times seven, then three times seven, then we continue to grow. Well, one day we, we showed up and we told these guys that we were going to do two times ten after having graduated at, at a rate of nine, about 85 to 90 percent, 95 percent of their max heart rate. One of our players shows up and, you know, they're waiting to hear what the conditioning guy is going to say on that day. And he says, we're doing two times ten at an 85 rate, which means a high rate. And his, his, his head did this. You know, like all of us, it hit him. He did not want to do it. Did he need to do it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Is that encouragement? Absolutely. Because we're helping him grow. We're helping him reach another level. His perspective on it changed the next day when we sat with him and we talked about him and what he wanted to achieve. He had written down on one of his goals, he wanted to be an under-20 national team player. And he's capable of it. We said, do you think you need to be conditioned to do that? Yes? Do you think you need to be con more conditioned than most anybody in this country? He said, yes. And all of a sudden, his perspective on doing 2 times 20 or 2 times 10 changed. He needed that. Our responsibility of coaches is giving them what they need, not what they want. That's a form of communication. The other is when they're doing it, we got to let them know. I've often referenced a book, Whale Done. Whale Done is a book about how they train killer whales and sea whales. What they do is they take the most dangerous predators in the sea, they put them in captivity and make them do whatever they want, which is pretty incredible. And then, for example, if they want them to jump over a rope 10 meters outside the water, what they do is they, they, uh, they put the, the, the rope 10 meters off the bottom of the tank, and every time it swims over that rope, they love it and hug it and feed it. And pretty soon, they raise the rope another 10 meters, and every time it swims over it, <coughs> they love it and hug it and feed it. And pretty soon, they have the rope 10 meters outside the water, and it's jumping over it. You know why? It wants to be loved and hugged and fed. We're no different. Our kids are no different. Now, if the if the animal, if the if the killer whale swims under a rope, what they don't do is whip it because they know they'll be eaten. <laughs> what they do do is redirect the behavior. They redirect their behavior so they can get them jumping over the rope, and then when they do, they love them, and hug them, and feed them. <clears throat> That's part of our culture. That's part of helping them provide the tools and the confidence and the freedom <coughs> to fail sometimes so that they can move forward and grow. <clears throat> Encouragement is giving them what they need, and then when they do it right, is catching them doing it right, and loving them, and hugging them, and feeding them. And if they're doing it wrong, is providing them the direction, redirecting their behavior, so that you can catch them doing it right, and then love them, and hug them, and feed them. The second thing is, we empower them. 
and we empower them by giving them opportunities. The game of soccer is beautiful from a standpoint of empowerment. Mario talked a little bit about this, of, of BJ allowing the kids to figure it out. How many times as coaches that we want to sit there like it's a video game and joystick the kids around the field? Now listen, if we make every decision for them on the field, kick it here, move here, go there, make that pass, drop, step, if there's a decision to be made on the field, then the kids are looking over and waiting for some suggestion of what to do. We empower our guys by giving them the opportunity to make decisions. That we don't joystick them through the field or in life. We set the guidelines and we set the standards and provide them the opportunity to make decisions on the field and off the field. And then after decisions are made, we come back and we say, look, did they have a benefit or consequence? Are they moving us in the direction of our goal? And that's why we need to have the direction. Because if we have a direction, then our, our decisions should line up with where we're headed. The decisions you made, are they moving us in that direction? And if not, probably not a proper direction or decision. Staying up till 1 o'clock in the morning, did that help you in today's training? Maybe not a good decision. What you ate last night going out to the fast food and how you're feeling, did it help you today? Putting off that assignment and doing it at the last minute, did it get you the GPA you wanted? But we need to provide them those opportunities, empower them by giving them the guidance, the direction, and allowing them to make opportunities. We had two things happen, one most recently, that, that tells us that providing them those opportunities, empowering them, is helping our, our guys grow. We had one a guy, first, Mike Morrow. You're not going to see him in any of the trainings because he just had surgery on his hand. So he's out from most of the spring, our number one keeper from last year. He ends up going to the youngest keeper we have, Daniel, who you saw him there. The youngest keeper's only been here for a semester, still green, still growing. And he pulls him aside. No, we didn't know anything about this. Pulls him aside. He said, Dan, would you understand the opportunity that you have this spring? I'm not there. You have a chance to win that first position. Daniel was a third, not the second, third. And as a leader of our team, without us knowing about it, he goes to the third keeper, telling him he can win his spot because he's out. How powerful is that? The kids are making those decisions. We were struggling early on to create this culture, and I'll tell you a story. Early on, we're training up here at Traeger. Our, um, uh, our, our, our facility where we train, our locker room, is about uh, half a mile down the road at Park Park. And one of the things, part of our culture is, look, we gotta, re we gotta be responsible, and one of the things we're responsible for is time. With that, we have to respect each other's time. I'll detour a little bit, and I, I often say this in my speeches, is, is time is our most valuable asset. asset. And it's also the, the democracy of life because everybody gets 24 hours. Everybody that woke up today gets 24 hours. Doesn't matter whether you're the president or the guy begging on the street, we all get 24 hours. It's how we use that 24 hours that determines our success in life. So we teach our guys, one, is respect the time and respect each other by being showing up on time. And then we have to manage that time that we have well if we want to be successful. So early on, we say, hey, look, and it's still today, if you don't show up on time for training, you don't earn the opportunity to train that day. You miss the opportunity, because it's a privilege. So early on, we're tra training up in Traeger. 8 o'clock is when training starts, and these guys are down in the locker room, and it must have been about 
20 minutes, 25 minutes before training, and two of the young guys, two of our younger guys, were trying to create this culture, responsibility, discipline, selflessness. We're talking about those days. They look over and the guy's not there. One of the players hadn't shown up yet. So they quickly dial, OT, where are you? What's going on? OT wakes up out of a dead sleep. Oh, my alarm didn't go off. I forgot to set it. Don't know. And they said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to gather our, your stuff. And we'll, we'll meet you in the middle of the quad. You can change there. We got time. I think we can make it. It's taking responsibility. Selflessness. They're looking out for each other. It's great. So they gather his stuff and they meet him in the middle of the quad and OT, you know, still barely awake, he's putting his stuff on. Getting ready to go, they got it, they think they can still make it. The two guys realize that they're missing their boots. They forgot their boots. They brought all of OT stuff, but they don't have their boots. So now they gotta hightail it from the quad back to the to the locker room and still get up here at time for eight o'clock. So I'm up at Traeger, I'm setting this all up and I'm getting ready for training. I know what's going on. A couple of players said, hey, I'm not sure if they're going to make it. Here's what's going on. So sure enough, I'm watching the clock, eight, getting close to 8 o'clock, and OT comes busting through the door. And he's looking at the clock he made in time. 8 o'clock comes. The other two aren't there yet. We start training. OT's body language, his posture is over, and he's looking at the clock. You can see he's filled with the guilt. Wondering what's happening when these two guys come in. So they come in the door two minutes after eight o'clock. We already started to warm up, the movement, exercise. They come running over to me and I, I approach them. I said, look, I know what's going on. You guys are late. Your responsibility now is to help facilitate training. Pick up cones, bash, whatever we need, gather the balls, but you guys don't train today because you're late. Now OT's body language really. He struggled, barely going through the warm-up. We get through the warm-up, we're heading to the next phase, and we're going through some functional stuff, I'm setting it up, and I kind of see OT coming, and I'm walking away. I'm trying to avoid it. I'm walking away, and I wouldn't want to talk to him. Coach! Coach! He gets close enough, and I can't ignore him. I said, OT, what? What's going on? <coughs> he said, it's not fair. I said, what are you talking about? He said, it's not fair. I should be the one not training today, not them. It's my fault those guys are late. I said, OT, we have rules. The rules are if you're past the time, you don't get the opportunity to train. Those guys were late, you're on time, you're training. But what those guys gave you is the opportunity to train today. They have given you a gift. And right now what you're doing is wasting that gift. You're wasting that opportunity. Right now, what they've done, the sacrifice, is going for nothing because you're wasting it. I said, you have a responsibility to those two guys to be your best. And then you make their actions worth something. He was unbelievable, the rest of the training. The best I had ever seen him, and rose the level not only of himself, but his team around him. That's when I was really sure that empowering this group of guys not only raised their level, but the team's level as well. We provide them those opportunities to maybe, hey, look, you've got to set your own alarm and be late, but we equally provide those opportunities when something's going wrong to get it right to empower each other and help each other and lift the level of what we're doing. We have to give them those opportunities. The third thing is we need to enjoy the process. And that as we go through it, there is a joy in what we do and there needs to be a, a, a passion and an excitement to what we do. When I, was at the, when I was at the University of, of Akron, one of the things that our, um, our team ended up doing almost by accident, the whole athletic department gets together and they were determined at the University of Akron, they had the fight song, right? They had the fight song and nobody in the athletic department knew the fight song. 
<laughs> so, so they gather the whole athletic department together, and they got all these kids together, and are teaching them the fight song, and they're kind of going, are you kidding me? Our guys, are you kidding me? We're sitting here, fun. so a little bit of tongue in cheek, our guys learn the fight song. It turns out that after every win we had that season, these guys were in a locker room singing a fight song. And they weren't singing it, they were screaming it with a passion and a joy and an excitement. And they took something that was so simple, but they brought a joy to it. And with it, a filling of a spirit that carried us through the season. Those moments of joy are so important to us because, again, they're a filling, an infilling of a spirit that can carry you on to bigger and better things. Joy is really a perspective, quite honestly. When how we look at things is up to us. The circumstances, quite honestly, can't dictate our joy. It's how we perceive it. And we as coaches, it is so, so important that we maintain a perspective of gaining something out of each experience to maintain that joy. That if our players see us take something that is a loss and our spirit changes because of it, and yet we have grown because of the loss, now we're telling them that the circumstances are going to change, are, are going to affect our spirit, are going to determine who we are, and determine whether we receive joy from it or not. It's a perspective. As we all know, and I think we would all agree, the most vivid memories we have are when we're most joyous. The imprint we have in our minds of those times where we have enjoyed things the most. It's our own perspective. We can gain anything we want from any circumstance. That's our choice. And we focus in what we do here is when you watch us train tomorrow, we're gaining what we can from each experience. And with that, part of that is joy, is fun, is enjoyment. All right, those are three things we focus on. The last thing I will say is this. If you're creating a culture, the most important thing is embodiment. Gandhi once said, be the change you want to see in the world. If you want your team to be disciplined, what do you like, look like? If you want your team to be responsible, what do you look like? If you want your team to be, to, to be selfless, what do you look like? There, there's a reason why, when you look at our guys, our staff, that we are, I believe, from our director of ops all the way down to every coach we have, the most fit staff in the country. Why? Well, look, if we're going to ask them to do it, we better be prepared to do it ourselves. Every single fitness exercise that we've done, Everybody in our staff has done as well. We're right next to them doing exactly what they're doing. It's the best example we can give. It's the best influence we can have is who we are and who we become. So once you set those values, once you set those ideals on what you want your team to look like, there's no more powerful influence than you have and who you become and who you are. And I would challenge you, because quite honestly, every organization, every team, every group is a direct reflection of their leader. Period. So if you're unhappy with your team, there's got to be some self-reflection going on. <coughs> I've found in my life, the more I've grown, the more my team has grown. Two reasons why, because I'm the example. The other is, then I have more to offer. If I'm leading a group and I have nothing to give them, how am I going to expect them to grow? The more I become, the more I have to offer. And the challenge is, as coaches, we sit here and we think, well, maybe it's just about the exercise. Maybe it's just about the drill. 
but really the teaching and coaching goes on has everything to do with who we are. And that's the, that's the, that's a, that's a confusing part of leadership is, is really it's not all about you. It's not. It's about them. And yet it is really all about you because you have to grow first to be able to help them. And I would challenge you to grow in two ways. One is, first of all, you being here is impressive. Because what you're saying is, look, I want to grow. I want to learn. I want to develop. I want to have something to bring back to my team. Mentorship is huge. Mentorship happens in a lot of ways. One is identifying yourself with somebody you, you want to be like. And it could be a direct relationship, but it doesn't have to be a direct relationship. It could be mentorship in a book, in a CD. I challenge you to read on a regular basis. Most every personal development talk I ever, ever do, I talk about reading 15 <coughs> minutes a day. 15 minutes a day. I was taught uh, years ago, Tina and I, so many uh, mentors of ours said, look, if you read 15 minutes a day for four years, you'll be one of the smartest people in the top 5% in the world in whatever area you decide. Here's why. Because if you read 15 minutes a day, it usually gets you through a chapter of a book. Most chapters are 15 chapters long. Yeah, about 15 chapters long. If you do the math, you get through two books a month. They said if you do that for four years, how many books you'll get through, the information you receive, the wisdom from that, and why? Because you can get through something in two weeks what it took somebody a lifetime to figure out. How powerful is that? 15 minutes a day. If you do that for 15 minutes a day, <coughs> top 5%. We believe them. Been doing it for the last 17 years. The reason why I can stand here before you, the success we've had, has everything to do with that. It's because of that growth that's happened within us first before we've ever had the chance to help anybody else. So I encourage you, I implore you as leaders, as coaches, is take responsibility for your own growth. Embody the team that you want to be, the principles that you want within your Because there's no more powerful, more powerful example and way to influence your team. Because here's the thing, is there is a culture within your team. There is. It exists right now. The question is, is it the culture you want? Is it the culture you desire? Is it the culture that's helping them grow and develop? And are you having an influence on that culture? It's your choice. The greatest influence you'll have is who you are. All right. Any any specific questions to me in regards to <laughs> our culture and what we've developed here? Before we head back over. Yeah. Uh, something I noticed this morning with, with your guys is that it seems like the culture is very positive. But then I was wondering if that's something you kind of encourage or that's just something that you naturally do. It is absolutely something we encourage. Everything from our words to, to how we greet each other to uh, our actions. And we, I was just talking with uh, Coach Davies, and you might see something uh, along this tomorrow, is, is that our body language, our positive body language, actually has a physiological effect on us. Our words, what we say, have an effect on our subconscious mind. If you ask Mario how he's doing, I'm sure... And this, this went back to the Akron days. I'm sure he's going to say I'm doing wonderful and great. Even when I knew that he was having sleepless nights. He has four kids within the ages of, of nine years. So I, I knew there, yeah, between nine and two, right? Seven years. I knew he was coming in some nights or some days and having not slept. And they'd ask him how he's doing and say, great. Why? Be, not because you hear it, but because he hears it. And those words influence us. How many times that we speak negative words to ourselves? We have the ability to influence ourselves through our own words. It is a very positive environment, very positive culture. Absolutely. Coach, of all the values of the team, what's the one you cherish the most? You know, I, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know if there's one because they build on each other. 
I don't know if I can I can designate one. I will tell you that the five that we we live by, the five that are important to us. One is is we compete, and compete is a is a many times a um, a word that is is not fully understood. Compete comes from a Latin word that means we search together. We search together. That we do it, we're moving in a certain direction, looking and searching and growing. That's what compete is. That's where it comes from. For us, that's an important part of what we do, is that we're collectively, constantly moving in a direction that we're finding ways that we need to continue to grow and get better. And the only way we can do that is with an adversary, an opponent, to really challenge ourselves. And many people think that competing is the opponent. It isn't. The competing is ourselves. How much we grow? What do we see? What do we search? So the competing aspect, every single day, do we show up in search of growth together? Number one. The other is attitude. Having a positive attitude in what we say and how we act and what we do. The energy needs to be positive. The attitude positive. The expectation positive. I know in my life that it has such a huge effect on what we do on a daily basis that we, we shape things in a way that there's always something to gain from it to stay positive. The next one is responsibility. That, that we, there's a term called poo, pride of ownership. That we're all responsible for our own <coughs> soccer, every single one. It doesn't matter whether you play 90 minutes every single game or you're redshirting, we all have the responsibility for what it looks like every single day. We all have the responsibility to take care of it. When we go someplace, our motto is we should leave it better than we found it. The bench, we go into a locker room, somebody else is locked, we should leave it better. Our program for the guys that come in, when they leave, they should leave it better than when they came in. That's the responsibility we all have. This isn't my program. It's our program. Fourth is discipline. Reading uh, Good to Great, in the first chapter of the book, it talks about great companies. The great companies have disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined action. The number one reason why people fail in life is a broken focus. They lose their way. We all know what we should do, don't we? We all. We all know what we should do. Do we have the discipline to do it every single day? That's huge. The last is selflessness. Selflessness is that we're giving up our, our own glory for that of the team, that we're helping each other become better. The best players I've ever known are those in the environment they make everybody around them better. Those are the best players. Those are the ones that we know change teams. When you can step on the field, and because I'm on the field, I make everybody else better. And that's tough to do at this age. The kids we have is to see beyond themselves, selflessness, is to do it. But again, when you're looking at the locker next to you and you see two guys, a guy that hasn't been there, and you, that's selflessness. Giving up your training for one day so somebody else can grow and develop. Yeah. Um, I was surprised to see in the paper the other day, or you had like five or six transfers coming in. Mm -hmm. How does that? I mean, does that make it more difficult to establish a culture when you've got people from other cultures coming in for shorter periods of time? The, 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 the way college athletics works is we're always having new guys coming in. Whether they're transfers or freshmen, we always have new people coming in. And it's important that, again, for those that are here, that they understand what the culture is, what's important to us. Can they communicate to the rest of us? Are they an example to the rest of them? Who are we? Are they saying it in unison? Can they communicate it? Again, it's not only our ability to communicate it to them, but for them, the ability to communicate it to guys that are coming in. They communicate it in a lot of ways. One, the words, by mostly their actions. 
Um, when you sit down with them individually and make goals, uh, do you guide them a lot, or do you have them come up with it and really focus on it? Combination of both. They come in with theirs, and then we help shape them. So it's a combination because they they can't be my they can't be my goals. And here's why: Has anybody ever rented a car here? Yeah. If you ever rented a car, have you ever waxed and shined it before you brought it back? <laughs> why? Because it's not yours. You're not going to take care of it like that. It's not yours. If they're my goals, you think they'll take care of them? Probably not like they should. If they're their goals, yeah, they'll probably be a little more attentive, wax and shine in a little bit. How do you deal with conflict on the field? Uh, players sometimes make it at each other. And mm -hmm. I've seen that in some of the games. Yeah. Uh, do you prefer to do it after the players? Or conflict, conflict is actually good. Conflict is good when it comes from the right motives. Before you can have good conflict, you have to have trust. If you have trust within the group, the trust that everybody is working for the common good, as long as we have that understanding and we trust that everybody's working towards the common good, if we don't agree because we think that, that, the, that our decisions will help us better towards the common good, that's okay. That's okay. Where it comes out, what it looks like when it comes out is important. Because for us as a team, we talk about conflict when it's public. It can't be criticizing each other or bringing them down. We try to do those kind of things in a private setting, so we're not doing it publicly. If it's in the heat of a battle, you can't, look, if there's bullets flying overhead and somebody's not getting it right, you gotta let them know right then and there there's gonna be conflict. You, you, you get me killed, knock it off. Stop. <coughs> Sometimes conflict has to happen there. Other times in a private setting is where it needs to be. So again, it depends. But conflict, when the trust is there, when you trust each other, conflict is okay. Can you share with us the significance of your partnership in your coaching success? Tina, you talk about Tina. My greatest blessing. Period. Period. She's my greatest blessing. There's, there's, uh, when two come together, it doesn't, it doesn't make two, it's multiples of them. And the fact that we work um, in direction together for a common cause is so powerful. And quite honestly, she keeps the balance in my life. Because as a male, sometimes I think I should be judged based on my job when I understand I have a family. You know, and really in my legacy, that's my greatest legacy is my family and to take care of that. So she keeps the balance for sure in my, my greatest blessing. No question about it. If you, if you find a partner um, that it is, it is, you're uh, connected together, there's nothing more powerful than that. Thanks for asking. Yes? Coach, I'm interested to hear your perspectives on the role your players' parents play in shaping your culture. My buddies in the college game continue to tell me more and more they're getting phone calls from parents and I know on the high school side our parents play a huge role in cultivating our culture. How, how has that experience been for, for you guys here at U of L? We, we include the parents. Uh, the relationship we have from a standpoint of, of uh, a daily basis is with the player. But again, when we're open and honest, you know, how, how we talk to the, the parents isn't going to be any different than what we talk to the player. It's not going to be any different than what I would say to the team. And, and one, of the, one of the things that we think is very important is, is quite honestly that when we're on road trips that my family comes with us because what, what, what we show the players is, is how I talk to Tyler or Elijah or Christiane or Tina is no different than how I talk to them. The standards I hold them to are no different than the standards I hold them. They know that my words and actions are congruent across all lines. And when you act in a way like that, then it doesn't matter whether the parents are in the room or not. It doesn't matter whether you're on the phone or not, you're telling the same thing. We may not always agree, but I will certainly tell you my perspective on how I am. And I think the parents respect that, and in that, usually distance themselves and allow us to make the decision because they're comfortable with that. And yet we include them. We go on a road, we want them to know where we're staying. 
So that if they're on the road in the same hotel and they get a chance to see their son, beautiful. We know that's likely going to enhance their ability to be successful, not the turf. It's trusting that in the culture as well. So we include that. That's how we do it. We know no different. I include my family in it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it any different for that. You said you uh, provide uh, the guidelines and guidance to the players up front, but then you empower them to make those decisions. Can you talk about the, the guidelines that you set for them up front? Well, the, the, the guidelines are simple things. You know, one is, is uh, don't disrespect the program, but two, there's other guidelines as well of be on top. You know, little guidelines like that, that if you are ill, that, that we need to know that you're not making it to training, so you need to text or call either to the sports medicine or us. You know, things like when we're on the road, we leave it the way we found it. So there's a, there are a host of guidelines, but the biggest guidelines are, are in this is, look, this is the direction we want to head as a team. This is the direction you want to head. So the guidelines are this. If you want to get there, there are certain things that you need to do to be successful. And we talk about them and their goals. Not only do we set five goals or six goals for them, we also talk about action steps. Those are the guidelines. You want to have a 3.5 GPA? You tell me how much you're studying. Write it down in your action goals. What are you willing to commit to? That's part of the guidelines. So we allow them to develop the, the action steps and the guidelines as well for what they need to do to get there. Goals are a wonderful thing because they motivate us to want to change and grow and become somebody different. That's why we set goals. The goals isn't to get there. That's not why we set them. We don't set them for the achievement. Andrew Farrell, quite honestly, we, we, first, first day I met him, he came on for an unofficial visit, and the very first thing I did was talk about setting goals. I said, what are your goals? What do you want to do? He didn't have them. I said, listen, son, you need to do this. His mom emailed me the next day. He said he's got them posted on his, on his uh, bed frame. One of those goals eventually was to be drafted in the MLS, number one. He was up there. He's drafted. He's got a scarf around him. That's not the payoff. The fact that he had the scarf and he was number one, that's not the payoff. The payoff is who he became. Because as soon as he was drafted, that moment was gone. History, done. It wasn't going to help him a bit. But the next challenge he faced, who he became to be the number one, he was prepared to take on. That's the payoff. The goals are just motivation for us to change and grow. That's why we set them. It's for who we become in the process of achieving them.